right. As we prepare for our Sabbath school lesson, let us have a word of prayer. Our Father God, we thank you so much for your Sabbath day, for inviting us to come and spend this day with you, to come apart from everything else, to, to forget about what's going on in the world right now, and to focus on you, to focus on your word, to focus on fellowship with you, fellowship with one another. And so, Father, as, as we come together, we again thank you for inviting us into your presence. And we pray, Father, that as we open up this Sabbath school lesson, that you will guide us through it that you will help us to understand from it what it is you want for us to understand, and that you will give us the insights that you have for us and help us to know how to apply it in our lives today. You have told us that all scripture is given to us for doctrine, for reproof, for instruction and in righteousness, and so that we know that this is to... There's an application of all scripture for us personally. So help us to see this and through it to grow closer to you, to trust you more, to love you more, and to be more prepared for the things that are ahead of us in this world. We pray this in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We are studying in the book of Acts. Currently, the section we're in is verses 13 through 30. In our lesson, this is, I forget what year it is, but it's from 1897. Studying the book of Acts, we're in lesson number six. Currently, we're at question number eight. Just to help bring everybody up to speed a little bit where we're at. What we found was in, in chapter 3, Peter and John were going to the temple to pray. It's at the, the time of prayer, and they were going to the temple, and at the gate beautiful where they were entering in, there was a man lame from birth. And he looked to them, hoping to get some sort of handout, and asking them for something. And Peter says, you know, silver and gold, we don't have any. But what we have, we'll give to you. And what they had was Jesus Christ. And told the man in the name of Jesus Christ, stand up and walk. And at that moment, the man was healed, got up, was able to walk, began praising God. Some people kind of took a little bit of offense to this because now he was doing stuff that on the Sabbath day was wrong. Or, well, maybe the, this one wasn't the Sabbath. I'm sorry. They, they weren't used to seeing this, and it did cause quite a stir. And so what they did was they came to Peter and John because Peter is the one that they looked at and said, you performed this miracle. And so Peter began to preach them a sermon, telling them that it was not through any power of themselves that this was done, but through the power of Jesus Christ. And even going to the point of telling them, you know, they had crucified him, and yet he rose from the grave. And so he had quite an opportunity to preach this sermon. Well, as a result of this, also the high priest. Anna, Ananias, or no, Annas the high priest, him and his council called Peter and John in to question them about this whole thing, the, the miracle that had been performed, but also them preaching Jesus Christ, who, of course, they had worked together to have him hung on the cross. And they learned with Peter and John, Scripture tells us in, in chapter 4 and verse 13, it says they perceived that they, the Peter and John were unlearned and ignorant, 
and they marveled and took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. So they saw these two men previously before being Christ's disciples were fishermen, kind of the, the low of the low, the uneducated. And yet they, in speaking to these two men, saw the boldness that they had, the understanding of things that they had, and obviously saw this miracle that was performed. And they weren't sure what to do. Obviously, they didn't want Jesus Christ preached. And they, they weren't sure really how to handle this. And so then they did come up with a plan. They, they sent Peter and John out, and the council just met among themselves. And they came up with a plan of what to do. And that brings us to question eight in our lesson. And it says, what charge did they give the disciples when they called them back in? And we find the answer to this in Acts chapter 4, verses 17 and 18. Would somebody be willing to read those two verses for us? Acts chapter 4, 17 and 18. But that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. Okay. So they couldn't deny that a miracle had taken place. They couldn't deny what these men were saying. They Scripture tells us that they could come up with nothing to go against what they were saying. They couldn't accuse them of lying. There, there was too much proof what they were saying was true. So what does it say that they decided to do? Threaten them. Okay, Key says they tried to cancel them. <laughs> That's Threaten. using today's terminology. Yes, Jolene, they, they threatened them. Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't say how they threatened them. Does it really matter how they were threatened? I mean, to, to me, a threat's a threat. A, a threat is a way of saying, you do things our way, or we're going to find a way to punish you. Now, thinking in terms of this, is this just something that happened back then? Or is this something that goes on today, something that we can expect even to happen to us? Amen. Okay, Rob, Rob and Jim put in the, the chat, they were taking away liberty of conscience, the same as we see today. Yeah, it had happened to us in the church as well when they put us out, not wanting to hear that uh, there were no trinity in the Bible. They don't want to hear that. So they menace, I would say the influence, they menace us to leave the church or else. They call the police on us. This is a threat too. Okay. Also, our brother Conrad Vine is a good example of what is happening now because everybody knows him. And that which is happening with him is not something simple. He's, he has been banned locally and generally. Everybody is just throwing him away only because he said that we must not be under the general conference all the time because of the coming uh, problems, he said that the general conference will not be able to receive money and give because it will be having the seal of Satan, the mark of the beast, if he will receive money and you know buying and selling. So he was banned for the sake of money. I mean, we are banned for the sake of the father and the son because we believe in the Father, and who is the Father of Jesus, the Son of God. And it is normal for us to be, like, you know, banned this way or cast out. But for money now, it is very serious. Well, and it's like they say, with just about anything, follow the money. You'll see what's going on when you follow the money. You'll see who's behind what. Yeah. As far as 
Conrad Vine goes, what I would suggest to anybody who's interested in this is go and listen to what he actually said. Don't just listen to what people are saying that he said, whether they're for him or against him. Go and listen to what his message was, and then you can listen to what the people have said about it. I mean, because, you know, Sister Nis just said some. I can tell you some things. Many other people can tell you some things. Go and listen to what he said, and you decide what it was he said, and then see if what people are saying is accurate or not. And I suggest this not only with him, but with anybody that you listen to, anybody that's being talked about in such a way. Go and listen to it straight from them and be honest about what's being said, too. I mean, a lot of times we twist things to make it say more the way we want it to help fit our agenda. Don't do that. I mean, that's what they were doing here. We want to make things fit our agenda. We know that you performed a miracle. We know what you're saying about Jesus Christ is true. But because we don't like to hear it, we don't want you to ever speak on it. We're going to let you go this time. Next time, we're not going to. As long as you won't preach anything in his name, you have to keep your mouth shut. These days are quickly coming upon you and I. I mean, in some places, some ways, this is already the norm, should we say? But, you know, here in the United States, there is a few places where this is happening, but it's not really happening on any kind of major scale, but it will soon. And we need to be ready for it. And we need to determine now how we're going to handle it, what we're going to do. Are we going to be like Peter and John and stand up boldly, professing the truth, come what may? If we decide that we're going to wait until that time comes, then we'll see how we handle it. We pretty much are already are kind of lost in that. We won't handle it well. Brother Keith, you got your hand up, go ahead. Good morning, everyone, happy Sabbath. So with regards to the situation and discussion, discussing Acts chapter four and Conrad Vine, both of them parallel essentially the same concept. And the concept essentially is, there is one version of the truth, and then there is the truth. And what James, what Peter and John were preaching was the truth as it is in Jesus. And as we know, we know that the father has a literal son, as Brother Rob preached last week. So these are things that are truth. It is inconvenient, though, in terms of the, uh, the, um, um, the present order of things, because it goes against. And because it goes against, you see the, the liberty of conscience being threatened and being suppressed. And... Brother Rob's counsel is very wise about actually listening to people's words instead of listening to the dilution of those said words. Because if you listen to Conrad Vine's sermon from the North New England Conference camp meeting, he presents a conditional statement, meaning if this happens again, then this should happen. And so what happens is people have essentially twisted his words to kind of fit whatever's going in their heads instead of trying to figure out what the actual truth is. Again, Brother Rob also brought it out that these men were unlearned. Uh, and that's a very salient point in that you don't have to have an advanced degree. The Jesuits have created an educational order where we, we look for the diploma, we look for the, the status in order to be able to then lend credibility. What the what was remarkable and was captured in scripture is Luke uh, captured the fact that these unlearned men were able to impress the Sanhedrin because they know like, you guys don't look like you should know anything. But three and a half years with Jesus has a positive effect. It has a, an effect on one's character such that it is 
visible. It's in the way we carry ourselves. And as much as we want to watch the new North New England Conference camp meeting, a sermon that Conrad Vine did, he did one two weeks ago at the Mentone Church. It's even more impressive than the one, the restraint, the true genuine love that he has for the church, even though he's been slighted, even though he's been canceled. In terms of additional watching, I highly recommend you look for the Mentone SDA sermon that he did about two, three weeks ago now. That one is an exceptional response to all the Ivor Myers, the Mark Finley. There's a whole bunch of different responses that are out there. But again, it's in the character in which uh, Peter and John carried themselves that was so remarkable to the Sanhedrin that Luke captured it in words and is carried on to us today. And I think that's the biggest teaching point. Thank you, Keith. Let's see, somebody, what's this in the chat? Wilson put in the chat, under the showers of the latter rain, the inventions of men, the human machinery will at times be swept away. The boundary of man's authority will be as broken reeds and the Holy Spirit will speak through the living human agent with convincing power. And let me add to that, to go along with Peter and John here, you don't, and what Keith said, you don't have to have a degree for the Holy Spirit to do this. He can use anybody that's willing to be used. Wilson goes on that these men should stand in a sacred place to be as the voice of God to the people as we once believed the general conference to be. That is past, that we, what we want now is a regal organization we want to begin at the foundation and to build upon a different principle. And that's from a general conference bulletin from 1901, April 3rd. So, and, you know, that's an important point to make for those within the Adventist church who are, well, hey, the general conference is the voice of God. We're told here that time has passed. And, you know, personally, I would say anyway, don't put your trust in any man or any organization. Can we listen to them? Yes. But take everything that is said and done back to the word of God. Are they following the word of God? If they're not, do not follow them. I don't care who they are. I, I, I don't care if it's your pastor over the last 50 years. I don't care if it's every pastor in the Adventist church or every pastor in every church. I don't care if it's the leadership in every church or if it's your mom or dad or brother or sister or who it is. If they speak not according to the word of God, scripture says there's no light in them. Don't follow them. Take everything yourself. Study to show yourself approved, not somebody else. Study to show yourself approved and make sure that whatever you are receiving from somebody else is in accordance with the word of God. If not, then let it go. So anyway, here we had in, in verses 17 and 18, Acts chapter 4, that the high priest and his council here were threatening James and John, or Peter and John and told them not to speak in the name of Jesus anymore. We're going to let you go, but don't speak in his name any, any longer. And how did James and John reply to this? Yes, Sister Ness. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Okay, they actually said something just a little bit before that, too. Whether it be right, important. <laughs> whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. Okay, <laughs> so first, these men that were threatening them, telling them you need to do things our way, their first reply was, You judge for yourself whether we should listen to you or God. Now, tell me. That's Peter already saying, we know we need to listen to God. He didn't come 
right out in that sentence and say, you, you make your decision who we ought to listen to. And, you know, this is a good statement to make to church leaders because aren't the church leaders typically anyway telling us study the scriptures follow the scriptures listen to the word of god do what the word of god says do this because the word of god says it do that because the word of god says it they supposedly keep pointing us to the word of god until the word of god contradicts them then it's no, you listen to us instead. We need to take this same counsel that, that Peter and John expressed here. And we need to hold firm to it. Don't let it go. Don't deviate from it at all. But we need to determine within our hearts that we are going to hearken unto God we're going to listen to him and we're going to obey him regardless of what anybody around us says, whoever that might be. And, you know, sometimes that's going to look like we're standing alone. We're going to be there by ourselves. It's, Peter and John had each other to depend on, which, you know, I think that's why when Christ sent the disciples out, he sent them out two by two. Being by yourself, it's easy to become discouraged. It's easy to back down. It's easy to just say, you know, we can handle this another time in another way. But when you've got somebody else there, they help strengthen you. You help strengthen each other. You help give each other boldness. You, 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 lack of a better way to put it at the moment, you help feed off each other. And so you're willing to do more, but we've got to realize there will be times where physically we are standing alone. The only one there with us will be the Spirit of God. And we're not going to see that. And sometimes it's not going to feel like that. Just the same as Christ was on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We are going to feel like God has forsaken us, that we are there by ourselves. But we have to trust the word of God. He has told us, I will never leave you nor forsake you. We have to hold firm to that and know regardless of what's going on, he's right there with us. And the question is, are we going to still stand boldly for him or are we going to deny him regardless of what they might do to threaten us? Put a gun to your head. You know what? If somebody puts a gun to your head and pulls the trigger, you know what the next thing is, right? You see Christ coming in the clouds. <laughs> hey, <laughs> can't can't fight those results too much. I mean, can't can't argue a whole lot with that. You do this to me, and the very next thing I know is Jesus coming in the clouds. You kind of did me a favor. <laughs> I mean, we don't like to think about it that way, but you know that's kind of true. And uh, even if, regardless of how they might choose to torture us or whatever else. We know that Christ is with us, and he will take us through it. He has promised that. And every trial that we go through in our life is an opportunity for two things. One, for us to grow more like Christ, and the other is for us to glorify his name. So, hey, if that's what trials do, no wonder Paul said, I glory in my tribulations. Shouldn't we also? We don't need to back down from them. But the more we stand up for them, the more we stand boldly for Christ in the times of trial, then the more we see the hand of God working in our lives. 
the more he is honored and glorified, and the more people are going to come to him as well. So we need to take this same stance that Peter and John took here. And, you know, I'm going to follow God rather than man, period. Now, the next verse, verse 20, we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Think about that for a moment. Think of what was said here. They didn't say we want to. They didn't say we need to. Basically, what they said was, we can't do anything else. This is question nine in our lesson. So, or questions nine and 10. So he says, they said, we can't help but to do anything else. This, this is all we can do. Think what that means for a moment. What does it really mean we can't but speak these things? It reminds me of the problem and the pleasure. I think it's a scripture, but the love of Christ constraineth me. Okay, yeah. good point. Yes, Sister Niss. Well, I read in Spirit of Prophecy, not from so long, concerning this matter i believe well if now we are with god now we are with god if we leave god for any reason if we loved anything or anyone more than god we are going to be doomed because we chose to love anything more than god and if we are doomed there is nothing to save us because we will be in the hands of satan and when we will be in the hands of satan satan is going to revenge he hates us, actually. There is nothing we can do but to claim the word of God. There are times that we want to, we are very discouraged. We are disappointed and we want to just give up and we want to just, you know, this is a very heavy cross, but we have no other choice. All we have to do is to press forward and go, you know, looking at Christ and by beholding, we will be changed. This is all that we can do receiving his character by his grace. Amen. And Brother and, Rob. Yes. And as Fiat said, by the love of God constraining, if you look at verse 8, it said, then Peter filled with the Holy Ghost. What choice did he have? You know, he was um, totally consumed. You know, he was directed by the Holy Ghost. He had no filter. He had to do exactly as the Spirit, you know, guided him. Yeah. Well, we can quench the spirit, but do we want to do that? We shouldn't want to do that. And if we're not going to quench the spirit, then yes, we do whatever it is the spirit is, is working in us to do. And, you know, that is to preach God and preach him boldly, preach Christ, make him known to the world. Uh, we We have to remember that what God is trying to do is reconcile the world to himself. Now, that doesn't mean just bring them all in and in, in droves and they they stay as they are and just, you know, I want to be with them in all their sin. No, he's trying to change us from our sin and he does do that. But what he's trying to do is help people to see his goodness and come willingly to him, not force them. And we have been called as ministers of reconciliation along with God. We are to work together with him for this purpose. If we're going to be ministers of reconciliation along with God, then we've got to speak the goodness of God. We've got to help people to see the truth of God. We've got to help them to see that what God has done, is doing, is promised to do. And then also man's attempts to stop that, Satan's attempts to stop that using man. And 
you know, we've got to be willing to speak this boldly. And when we think about any time that there's a trial going on with us, Scripture tells us our fight's not against flesh and blood. Peter and John's fight here was not with the council. Their fight was actually with Satan, and Satan was using the council. And we've got to keep that in mind, is whether it's an individual or the local church body or the whole denomination or Christianity, period, if we're standing on the word of God and they're opposing us, our fight still is not with them. They are being led by the devil and hopefully don't realize it. I say that because I, I would hate to think that they're calling themselves Christians knowing they're working for the devil and intentionally doing that. But hopefully they don't realize it. And by us standing firmly for God, then we are working as a minister of reconciliation. We are helping make the truth of God known before them so that they can turn from that and surrender themselves to him that they too might be saved. Yes, Sister Yelaine. And also, Brother Wob, we have to remember that they are ruling with tradition because none of them accepted Christ as their Savior. I'm talking about the Pharisees. They didn't accept Christ as their Savior. So they thought that they were doing good, the good of doing what they do by the knowledge of what they know, but not accepting Christ as their Savior. So they didn't want to hear about the miracles of the, the apostle or the disciples of Christ who had received the spirit of God in them to do what God led them to do. And, you know, that's a really good point that they were doing what they thought was right. Mm -hmm. Tradition. Well, and, and it's not just tradition. I mean, according to their understanding of the scriptures, they were doing what they thought was right. And we're told in scripture you know, that they will put us out of the synagogues, which means out of the churches today, and they will even kill us, imprison us and kill, kill us, thinking that they're doing the will of God. So, you know, we, we need to help them to, need to take each of these things as an opportunity to help people to see the true will of God. And not take it, don't take it as just a personal attack on you. It's not a personal attack on you. It may be centered on you, but it's really an attack on God. And we're given the opportunity to be an ambassador for God and help people to see the truth of what he's really like. That's a great calling. That's a great call. Yes, Wilson, go ahead. I am. Um... I've been going to church for a while now, a local church. I did not go there to listen to lies. I went there to share the truth that I do know with them. And week after week during the Sabbath school, I brought up Jesus as the only literal son of God. And one time a Sabbath school brought up, um, what is the tradition of men? Give us an example. And uh, I said the 28 fundamental beliefs by the Seventh-day Adventist church is an example of traditions of men. And uh, most recently during a Sabbath school, I I was impressed to call the whole church as to, during the Sabbath school, I asked, does anybody here believe that Jesus is not the literal son of God? And I said, if you ra raise your hand, if you believe Jesus is metaphorically son of God, no one raised their hand, including the Sabbath teacher. Even the Sabbath school teacher says Jesus is the literal son of God. And I said, okay. And after that, the pastor tries to silence me. And over what I bring up in Sabbath school, week after week after week, I mean, it's been ongoing for a few months, actually. So he finally says, if you're not going to be respectful towards the 28 fundamental beliefs, then don't join any of the church events and church because it's creating a hostility and is making the members of the congregation very uncomfortable. And so I share with the pastor, pastor, 
I have said to the whole Sabbath school class that, and they all agree with me, that Jesus is the literal Son of God. You and the General Conference alone believe Jesus is the metaphorical Son of God. Why don't you say in front of the congregation what you believe, and we shall end this conflict? So I did not, so he tries to bring in the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, and all that kind of things. I said, I'm not here to debate or talk about any of those stuff. I only need one statement of you. Do you believe Jesus is the Son of God, truly? If you do, if you do not, proclaim it so that the congregation will know your stance. So they have the on, uh, fair opportunity to pick. So in verse 21 here, it says, because of the people, they did not punish Peter and John. And majority of the Seventh-day Adventists believe Jesus truly is the Son of God. But they also believe in the Trinity. They don't know the fact that they cannot coexist. But if we just bring forth the point that do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? And push the pastor to make a statement that's contradic that contradicts the member's belief, then people will wake up and make that decision. So I think... Many times, even when Jesus was on this earth, the leaders couldn't punish him because of the people, because there are a mass amount of Seventh-day Adventist church members that still believe Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. It's just only the leaders believe in the metaphor and the lies and those kind of things. So I think leadership does not represent the church, and we don't necessarily have to go to church to hear lies, we can go to church and participate in the Sabbath school and to correct the lies that's taught by the church. I appreciate that, Wilson, really do. And, you know, that took a lot of boldness to be able to do that. And, and I, I have no doubt, heaven commends you for it, for sure. And I agree with you that I, I've told people the same thing. You know, when I go to church, I go hoping to get at least one little thing out of it, but I go for the greater purpose of, Lord, how can you use me there? And that's what we need to do, especially in times such as today with certain truths. And to hold the pastors accountable for what they believe. And, you know, we need to, like you said, he... You were asking a question and he tried to take it off on something else. No, bring them back to the question that's being brought up as the issue at the moment. And, you know, we will find, I think, many times that the people go along with the things that we're expressing because it is the word of God. It is the truth. And they're going to see that so much of the leadership is not following the word of God. And, and I'm glad you brought up, Don, I see your hand. I'm glad you brought up verse 21, because when Peter and John said this, our next question in the lesson was, what did the council still further do? And why didn't they punish the apostles? And they threatened them again is what they did. And yet they did nothing to them because of the people. They didn't want to suffer from the people. And, you know, Conrad Vine was mentioned earlier. That's part of what's going on there is they're threatening him. And yet if they see the people rise up and... You know, the, the people threaten back, which typically is with the money. Hey, let him speak or we're, we're going to withhold our tithes and offerings from you. Then they'll let him in. They'll do a lot for money. We've, we've already seen most people will do anything for money. People sell their, sell their souls to the devil for money. The love of money, Scripture says, is the root of all evil. So... We've got all those things taking place in there. But, you know, Scripture tells us there's nothing new under the sun. The things that happened back then are the things that are going to happen today. These things are written for our admonition, so we know what's coming. We know how to handle them. And when we stand boldly for truth, God stands with us 
and many people will stand with us. There will be those who reject us. There will be those who, who hold fast to the leadership because the leadership can't be wrong. But, you know, it's more important that we stand for God and others will see that too. The greatest times of growth of the church has been during the times of persecution. And hey, if we're really wanting to help people to see God in truth and come to him, is my life too sacred to use as part of that? If my death is going to bring somebody to Christ, let me die now. If my life is going to bring more, so be it. Lord, whatever way you can use me, whether it be in life or death, that's the way I see it. Go ahead, Donna. Yes, going back to verse 24, we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. And in verse 30, so they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And to have that, that real, that practical, that physical experience as we read 1 John 1 to 4, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that he also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the father and with his son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. So, you know, what we have seen and heard, the, this presence, this touching, feeling him as faith, you know, the love of Christ constrain it all. Oh, oh, can I not express? Oh, can I not tell you what you have done to him? And what the joy you will have in him if you really get to know him and his father. So, you know, so the connection uh, with all of those. Amen. Thank you. Wilson? And also, you know, I thought like my family was going to be kicked out of the church that that week. And but uh, to our surprise, it's not we don't like going to church because of the errors. But the Lord continued to urge us to go to the church and the pastor preached. And then he says, the Lord really greatly humbled me this week. And so he revealed to the pastor how how he was in the wrong in trying to silence. And after the sermon, I talked to the pastor and uh, he said, you know, I, I agree with you. We ought to follow Jesus instead of the 28 fundamental beliefs. And I've heard of those that believe Jesus as the only literal son of God. I haven't studied the issue out. Maybe one day I will be like you and be kicked out as well. So, I mean, we never know what will be the end result because God is working. He doesn't have that many years left. He's preparing a people. We should um, expect the most from the Lord because I think Lord's going to do great things among various flocks of God's people. Amen. And, you know, it, even though some people don't look like it now, there are many sincere people out there that God is using and leading and, you know, they may be in error at the moment, but that doesn't mean God's not going to bring them to the truth. Look at all of us. How many of us were in error and God brought to this truth? And that doesn't mean that we're not in error in some way, even still. And God wants to bring us to truth. So, you know, we need to be careful the judgments we make upon others. And let's see how God can use us to help reveal truth instead of bringing condemnation. Yolaine, go ahead. Yes, but one thing you just said, let's not judge. We are not here to judge anybody, but speak the truth, because the truth shall set us free, because we are not the judge. Christ is the judge, and we know when the time comes, we will be judged, just to say that. And uh, what you said before regarding the group in the church, when they don't want, they kick us out of the church because of the truth. We are, we are opening their eyes to the truth. And they, what they said to me when I approached the situation, they told me that they don't want to upset 
the, elder, the older people in the church because, you know, they are the one who bring the, the, the tide, the good tide to help them keep the church going. They don't want to upset those old people. And this is to, to, to show you that they are the one who bring in the money to help them stay alive. The truth doesn't matter to them, but they see what they're receiving from those people who are content with whatever they're getting, coming and seeing and eat the, 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 the fellowship meal and stuff like that, because at home they have nothing to help them stay alive, you know, in, in the, the joy of what they are doing every day. They come to church, they give the time, they, whatever it is that they say to them, they take it home without searching the Bible. But those who are searching the word of God for the truth, they don't watch you there because you're disturbing the crowd. You're upsetting those people. This is something that, you know, we have to keep in mind that uh, God will, will use us when and where it is necessary for us to be and preach his word. Yep. Yeah, and, you know, when we're being presented that we're the ones causing trouble, which is what I was presented with where I last was as well, and I got kicked out, not as much because of my belief and it being contrary, but because me sharing things was troubling to people. Jesus troubled the church. Elijah was called the troubler of Israel because he was speaking the truth. The truth is going to bring trouble because it contradicts what people are currently believing. And yes, it may cause confusion for the moment until they're willing to study it and look at it. And then it is freeing, is eye-opening. It opens up a lot more scripture as well. And so don't let being called the, a troublemaker or that you're bringing trouble be something to stop you i like the way that wilson handled this he was because he had already asked the question beforehand was able to say hey i'm not troubling them they're, they're in agreement with what i've said you need to say what you believe to show whether there's really decision or not whether there's really trouble just because you agree with me disagree with me doesn't mean that everybody else is troubled and so, you know, as we're open to the guidance of, of God in our lives, he will give us the words to speak. He's promised that he will give us the words to speak when we're in such situations. And so we can stand boldly. There's nothing really, no, no good reason for us not to. And we cannot claim ignorance or anything else. Hey, as scripture says, Peter and John were ignorant men. The Holy Spirit brings us the words of God. There's no ignorance there. We don't have to use our own words. We use God's words. So we're on good ground. So as we look at what is taking place here, what happened with Peter and John we can expect these same things to happen with us. The, we have to make a decision now, you know, how much am I willing to withstand? Am I going to, will, will I be okay if somebody just, if they kick me out of the church, okay, I can handle that. If they say bad things about me, if they threaten me with imprisonment or threaten my family or threaten my life, am I still okay with that? Will I stand boldly for God regardless of what happens? And, you know, it's, it kind of seemed out of place with me in, in this story if you look at verse 22 here, as Peter and John were going through all this, and the, the man who was lame, you know, we talked about that in chapter three, 
now here it is, we're in chapter four, and there's been all this other stuff taking place. Verse 21, so when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God that which was for that which was done. For the man was above 40 years old on whom the miracle of healing was showed. And you know, that verse 22, just stating how old the man was, kind of seemed to me odd to be put there. Why is this put here in this place? What difference does that really make? And especially in light of everything else going on. But I think what that was, was a reminder of what's actually taking place. It takes us back, of course, first to the man, which here he was, it says 40 years old. Do you remember how long he had been lame? How old was this guy when he was lame? Went went lame. If you look at since he was born. Okay. That's what I was gonna say. You go back to chapter three, verse two, it tells us from the womb he was lame. So from birth, so his entire life he had been lame. It wasn't something that just happened. His entire life, and obviously he had been taken to doctors and healers and herbalists and whoever else might be able to do something. I mean, you, you would really expect that to be the case. And nothing worked. But here, Peter and John were able to heal him in an instant. They just met the man, and instantly the man is healed. But they let us know it's not by their own power, but the power of Jesus Christ. And now you're going to threaten me because I... I'm following and preaching Jesus Christ? Look, let, let's look at what started this today. The healing of somebody who's been lame from the time he was born through 40 years. And I already told you it was Jesus Christ who had the power to heal him. And now I'm preaching Jesus Christ and you think you can threaten me? The power's on my side not yours. And that's what we've got to remember is who God is, who Christ is, what they can do, what they have promised. As long as we remember who God is and what he's already done in our lives and that he's promised to never forsake us, we've got nothing to fear whatsoever. We're on the winning side. We're on the side of the one with power. The one who is strength above all strength. The one who is everything of any value. We're on his side. There's no reason to fear anything that man can put at you. Yes, Wilson. I think many of us don't actually realize how strong our position is. And what I mean by that is, after I called the Sabbath school to proclaim Jesus as the only literal begotten son of God, I sent an email to every pastor in Ontario Conference, which is about over 100 pastors through the 100 churches. And I declared that this is what this local Seventh-day Adventist church believed. And if you guys believe Jesus is a son of God metaphorically, Proclaim it from the pulpit and see if your members will believe you because only the leadership believes that lie. And so what, what I mean is before Jesus was crucified, the high priests demanded, are you the son of God? And Jesus died for being the son of God. Now the table is turned. Let the Seventh-day Adventist people demand from the leadership. Is Jesus the Son of God? And the same trap that they sold for Jesus, they're going to fall in the same trap they set up. And Jesus, being the Son of God, will overthrow the Trinity in God's church. I believe that. Amen. Amen. So, you know, if we get nothing else from this lesson, you know, we, we not only have the testimony here, 
written of, of Peter and John, but I'm so glad Wilson's been on with us today to share his experience because this is a Peter and John experience that he's gone through and is able to share with us and to show the hand of God moving forward with his truth. And God is the one proclaiming his truth. We're just his instruments that he's using. And so with that being the case, we know that we're, we're not standing on our own. We're not doing this by ourselves, but we are the instruments of God. He is the one in charge. He's the one leading it. We need to be willing to listen to his voice and to stand boldly for him, come what may. And we know what the end is. The end is, if we decide not to stand for him and side with man, we're lost. But should we choose to stand with God regardless of what man might threaten to do, and regardless of what he actually does carry forth with, we know the end result is us spending eternity with God. I don't know about you, but I'd rather be tortured for the next 20 years than to give up being with God for all eternity. 20 years is nothing. I can handle that especially with God by my side. I don't even want to think about eternity without God. Uh, I, I so long to be with him that I don't want to give that up for any reason. Sister Ness, go ahead. Did you have something you want to say? Yeah, it's, we have two ways. It's either to be with God and serve God and even to suffer for him, or we will be doomed because Satan is waiting for us. Mm to kill us, <laughs> to kill us eternally, and never to wake up no matter what, to burn us, to do all that he can. I'm seeing this. It's a testimony that I'm seeing it. Someone, I cannot say he's doomed forever, but I know very well he was in the Lord, in the faith, and then he went from the faith. And now he's doing worse than before, and, you know, Satan is really, really revenging. I can see it. He hates him more than anyone in the world. He is his worst enemy. So we don't have, we don't have a choice. Either we have to go with God and stand, or we will be doomed by Satan. So I prefer to be with, in the hand, under the hand of God. And I pray that all of us do the same in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's close with that. Let's pray. Our Father God, again, we thank you so much for your word to, to give us the guidance that you're wanting to give us, to give us understanding of, you know, what all is going on in this world and what we can expect in our lives. And Father, I pray that you will be with each and every one of us here that we will be like Peter and John and then like Wilson speaking before his church and that we will stand boldly, stand strong, stand on your word, knowing that you're there with us and that you've given us your truth to share that we will not let the threatenings of man deter us in any way. But we will be, as Sister Faye brought out, constrained by the, your truth, by your love to, to go forward, to, to, again, to stand up boldly and, and not be afraid of anything. You have not given us a spirit of fear. Father, help us. Help us that if there's anything within us that is not willing to stand, stand strong for you, that will be removed. Help us to see it, to repent of it, to give it over to you, to surrender ourselves completely to you, that you can use us in ways that we've never even dreamed possible. Not that we necessarily want to be a, a big name or anything else, but 
we just want to glorify you, Father. We want to glorify you, and we want nothing to keep us from entering your kingdom when that time should come. So, Father, help us to honor you in all things by fully submitting ourselves unto you, and we give you all the glory and praise for it as we pray these things in the holy name of your son, Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, our brother. Amen.